Chapter 11, Part 1 of The Scouts of Stonewall. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Scouts of Stonewall by Joseph A. Altscheller. Chapter 11, The Night Ride, Part 1. Harry was back with the general in a few hours, but now he was allowed a little time for himself. It seemed to occur suddenly to Jackson that the members of his staff, especially the more youthful ones, could not march and fight more than two or three days without food and rest. "'You've done well, Harry,' he said. He was beginning to call the boy by his first name. The words of praise were brief, and they were spoken in a dry tone, but they set Harry's blood aflame. He had been praised by Stonewall Jackson, the man who considered an ordinary human being's best not more than third-rate. Harry, like all the others in the Valley Army, saw that Jackson was setting a new standard in warfare. Tremendously elated, he started in search of his friends. He found the Invincibles, that is, all who were left alive, stretched flat upon their sides or backs in the orchard. It seemed to him that St. Clair and Langdon had not moved a hair's breadth since he had seen them there before. But their faces were not so white now. Color was coming back. He put the toe of his boot against Langdon's side and shoved gently but firmly. Langdon awoke and sat up indignantly. "'How dare you, Harry Ketton, disturb a gentleman who is occupied with his much-needed slumbers?' he asked. "'General Jackson wants you.' "'Old Jack wants me. Now what under the sun can he want with me?' "'He wants you to take some cavalry, gallop to Washington, go all around the city, inspect all its earthworks, and report back here by nightfall.' "'You're making that up, Harry, but for God's sake don't make that suggestion to old Jack. He'd sent me on that trip, sure, and then have me hanged as an example in front of the whole army when I failed.' I won't say anything about it. You're a bright boy, Harry, and you're learning fast. But things could be a lot worse. We could have been licked instead of licking the enemy. I could be dead instead of lying here on the grass, tired but alive. But, Harry, I'm growing old fast. How old are you, Tom? Last week I was nineteen, today I'm ninety-nine, and if this sort of thing keeps up, I'll be a hundred and ninety-nine next week. St. Clair also awoke and sat up. In some miraculous manner, he had restored his uniform to order, and he was as neat and precise as usual. "'You two talk too much,' he said. "'I was in the middle of a beautiful dream when I heard you chattering away.' "'What was your dream, Arthur?' asked Harry. "'I was in St. Andrew's Hall in Charleston, dancing with the most beautiful girl you ever saw. I don't know who she was. I didn't identify her in my dream. There were lots of other beautiful girls there, dancing with fellows like myself, and the roses were everywhere, and the music rose and fell like the song of angels, and I was so happy, and I awoke to find myself here on a hillside with a ragged army that's been marching and fighting for days and weeks, and which, for all I know, will keep it up for years and years longer. I have a piece of advice for you, Arthur, said Langdon. What is it? Quit dreaming. It's a bad habit, especially when you're in war. The dream is sure to be better than the real thing. You won't be dancing again in Charleston for a long time, nor will I. All those beautiful girls you were dreaming about but couldn't name will be without partners until we're a lot older than we are now. Langdon spoke with a seriousness very uncommon in him, and lay back again on the ground, where he began to chew a grass stem meditatively. Go back to sleep, boys, you'll need it, said Harry lightly. Our next march is to be a thousand miles, and we're to have a battle at every milestone. You mean that as a joke, but it wouldn't surprise me at all if it came true, said Langdon as he closed his eyes again. Harry went on and found the two colonels sitting in the shadow of a stone fence. One of them had his arm in a sling, but he assured Harry the wound was slight. They gave him a glad and paternal welcome. In the kind of campaign we're waging, said Colonel Leonidas Talbot, I assume that anybody is dead until I see him alive. Am I not right, eh, Hector? "'Assuredly you're right, Leonidas,' replied Lieutenant Colonel Hector St. Hilaire. "'Our young men don't get frightened because they don't have time to think about it. "'Before we can get excited over the battle in which we are engaged, we've begun the next one. "'It is also a matter of personal pride to me that one of the best bodies of troops in the service of General Jackson "'is of French descent like myself.' "'The Acadians, Colonel,' said Harry. "'Grand troops they are.' "'It is the French fighting blood,' said Lieutenant Colonel Hector St. Hilaire with a little trace of the grandiloquent in his tone. Slurs have been cast at the race from which I sprang since the rout and flight at Waterloo, but how undeserved they are. The French have burned more gunpowder and have won more great battles without the help of allies than any other nation in Europe. 
and their descendants in North America have shown their valor all the way from Quebec to New Orleans, although we are widely separated now, and scarcely know the speech of one another. It's true, Hector, said Colonel Leonidas Talbot. I think I've heard you say as much before, but it will bear repeating. Do you think, Hector, that you happen to have about you a cigarette that has survived the campaign? Several of them, Leonidas. Here, help yourself. Harry, I would offer one to you, but I do not recommend the cigarette to the young. You don't smoke. So much the better. It is a bad habit, permissible only to the old. Leonidas, do you happen to have a match? Yes, Hector, I made sure about that before I asked you for the cigarettes. Be careful when you light it. There is only one match for the cigarettes of both. I'll bring you a coal from one of the campfires, said Harry, springing up. But Lieutenant Colonel Hector St. Hilaire waved him down courteously, though rather reprovingly. You would never fire a cannon shot to kill a butterfly, he said, and neither will I ever light a delicate cigarette with a huge, shapeless coal from a campfire. It would be an insult to the cigarette, and after such an outrage I could never draw a particle of flavor from it. No, Harry, we thank you. You mean well, but we can do it better. Harry sat down again. The two colonels, who had been through days of continuous marching and fighting, knelt in the lee of the fence, and Lieutenant Colonel Hector St. Hilaire also shaded the operation with his hat as an additional protection. Colonel Leonidas Talbot carefully struck the match. The flame sputtered up, and his friend brought his hat closer to protect it. Then both lighted their cigarettes, settled back against the fence, and a deep peace appeared upon their two faces. Hector, said Colonel Talbot, only we old soldiers know how little it takes to make a man happy. You speak truly, Leonidas. In the last analysis, it's a mere matter of food, clothes, and shelter, with perhaps a cigarette or two. In Mexico, when we advanced from Veracruz to the capital, it was often very cold on the mountains. I can remember coming in from some battle, aching with weariness and cold. But after I had eaten good food and basked half an hour before a fire, I would feel as if I owned the earth. Physical comfort, carried to the very highest degree, produces mental comfort also. Sound words, Hector. The starved, the cold, and the shelterless can never be happy. God knows that I am no advocate of war, although it is my trade. It is a terrible thing for people to kill one another, but it does grind you down to the essentials. Because it is war, you and I have an acute sense of luxury, lying here against a stone fence, smoking a couple of cigarettes. That is, Leonidas, we are happy when we have attained what we have needed a long time, and which we have been a long time without. It has occurred to me that the caveman, in all his primitive nakedness, must have had some thrilling moments, moments of pleasures of the body, the mind, and the imagination allied, which we modern beings cannot feel. To what moments do you allude, Hector? Suppose that he has just eluded a monstrous saber-toothed tiger and has slipped into his cave by the opening, entirely too small for any great beast of prey. He is in his home. A warm fire is burning on a flat stone. His wife, beautiful to him, is cooking savory meats for him. Around the walls are his arms and their supplies. They eat placidly while the huge tiger from which he has escaped by a foot or less roars and glowers without. The contrast between the danger and that house, which is the equivalent to a modern palace, comes home to him with a thrill more keen and penetrating than anything we can ever feel. The man and his wife eat their evening meal and retire to their bed of dry leaves in the corner. They fall asleep while the frenzied and ferocious tiger is still snarling and growling. They know he cannot get at them, and his gnashings and roarings are merely a lullaby, soothing them to the sweetest of slumbers. You could not duplicate that in the age in which we live, Leonidas. No, Hector, we couldn't. But as for me, I can spare such thrills. It seems to me that we have plenty of danger of our own just now. I must say, however, that you put these matters in a fine poetic way. Have you ever written verses, Hector? A few, but never for print, Leonidas. I am happy to think that a few sonnets and triolets of mine are cherished by middle-aged but yet handsome women of Charleston that we both know. Harry left them, still talking in rounded sentences and always in perfect agreement. He thought there is a beautiful friendship, and he hoped that he should have friendships like it when he was as old as they. But he and all the other prophets were right. The restless Jackson soon took up the northward march again. He was drawing farther and farther away from McClellan and the southern army before Richmond, and the great storm that was gathering there. The army of Banks was not yet wholly destroyed, and there were other northern and undestroyed armies in the valley. His task there was not yet finished. Jackson pushed on toward Harper's Ferry and the Potomac. 
He was now, though to the westward, further north than Washington itself, and with other armies in his rear he was taking daring risks. But as usual he kept his counsels to himself. All was hidden under that battered cap, to become later an old slouch hat, and the men who followed him were content to go wherever he led. The old Stonewall Brigade was in the van, and Jackson and his staff were with it. The foot cavalry, refreshed by a good rest, were marching again at a great rate. Harry was detached shortly after the start, and was sent to General Winder with orders for him to hurry forward with the fine troops under his command. Before he could leave Winder, he ran into a strong northern force at Charleston, and the southern division attacked at once with all the dash and vigor that Jackson had imparted to his men. They had, too, the confidence bred by continuous victory, while the men in blue were depressed by unbroken defeats. The northern force was routed in fifteen or twenty minutes, and fled toward the river, leaving behind it all its baggage and stores. Harry carried the news to Jackson and saw the general press his thin lips together more closely than ever. He knew that the hope of destroying Banks utterly was once more strong in the breast of their leader. The members of the staff were all sent flying again with messages to the regiments to hurry. The whole army swung forward at increased pace. Jackson did not know that new troops had come for Banks, but soon he saw the heights south of Harper's Ferry, and the same glance told him that they were crowded with soldiers. General Saxton, with 7,000 men and 18 guns, had undertaken to hold the place against his formidable opponent. General Jackson held a brief council, and when it was over, summoned Harry and Dalton to him. "'You both are well mounted and have had experience,' he said. "'You understand that the army before us is not by any means the only one that the Yankees have. Shields, Ord, and Fremont are all leading armies against us. We can defeat Saxton's force, but we must not be caught in any trap.' Say not a word of this to anybody, but ride in the direction I'm pointing and see if you can find the army of shields. Other scouts are riding east and west, but you must do your best nevertheless. Perhaps both of you will not come back, but one of you must. Take food in your saddlebags and don't neglect your arms. He turned instantly to give orders to others, and Harry and Dalton mounted and rode, proud of their trust, and resolved to fulfill it. Evening was coming as they left the army and disappeared among the woods. They had only the vague direction given by Jackson, derived probably from reports brought in by other scouts, but it was their mission to secure definite and exact information. "'You know this country, George, don't you?' asked Harry. "'I've ridden all over it. They say that Shields with a large part of McDowell's army is approaching the valley through Manassas Gap. It's a long ride from here, Harry, but I think we'd better make for it. This horse of mine is one of the best ever bred in the valley. He could carry me a hundred miles by noon tomorrow.' "'Mine's not exactly a plow horse,' said Harry, as he stroked the mane of his own splendid bay, one especially detailed for him on this errand. "'If yours can go a hundred miles by noon tomorrow, so can mine.' "'Suppose, then, we go a little faster.' "'Suits me.' The riders spoke a word or two. The two grand horses stretched out their necks, and they sped away southward. For a while they rode over the road by which they had come. It was yet early twilight, and they saw many marks of their passage, a broken-down wagon, a dead horse, an exploded caisson, and now and then something from which they quickly turned away their eyes. Dalton knew the roads well, and at nightfall they bore in toward the right. They had already come a long distance, and in the darkness they went more slowly. "'I think there's a farmhouse not much farther on,' said Dalton, "'and we'll ask there for information. It's safe to do so, because all the people through here are on our side.' There, you can see the house now. The moonlight disclosed a farmhouse, surrounded by a lawn that was well sprinkled with big trees. But as they approached, Harry and Dalton simultaneously reined their horses back into the wood. They had seen a dozen troopers on the lawn, and the light was good enough to show that their uniforms were, or had been, blue. A woman who was standing in the open door of the house, and one of the men who seemed to be the leader, was talking to her. Yankee scouts, whispered Harry. Undoubtedly. The Yankee generals are waking up. Jackson has made them do it, but I didn't expect to find their scouts so far in the valley. Nor I. Suppose we wait here, George, until they leave. It's the thing to do. They rode a little further into the woods, where they were safe from observation, and yet could watch what was passing at the house. But they did not have to wait long. The troopers evidently got little satisfaction from the woman to whom they were talking and turned their horses. Harry saw her disappear inside, and he fairly heard the door slam when it closed. The men galloped southward down the road. Harry heard a chuckle beside him as he turned in astonishment. "'I'm laughing,' said Dalton, "'because I've got a right to laugh. 
Here in the valley we are all kin to one another, just as you people in Kentucky are all related. The woman who stood in the doorway is cousin Eliza Pomeroy. She's about my seventh cousin, but she's my cousin just the same, and if we could have heard it, we would have enjoyed what she was saying to those Yankees. Aren't we to stop also and get news if we can? Of course. We must have a talk with Cousin Eliza. End of chapter 11, part 1.